the ancient Euro-Asian country of Azerbaijan on the Caspian Sea and surrounded by the Caucasus Mountains has incredible cultural and natural history. Hello, I'm Nancy Perlman on this edition of Eco News. We have a dialogue about the area's unique environment. With me is the Honorable Nassimi Agayev. He is the Consul General of the Republic of Azerbaijan in Los Angeles. He is Dean of the Los Angeles Consulate Corps, which represents over 105 nations. He has previously served as a diplomat in the Azerbaijan embassies in Austria, Germany, and Washington, D.C., and is fluent in seven languages. Welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. It's great to be on your show. We must explain where this beautiful country is because it's on the Caspian Sea. It has the Caucasus Mountains. It has over nine climatic zones. It's a remarkable country, but how big is it? So uh, Azerbaijan is as big as the state of Maine or the country of Austria in Europe. And the population is 10 million. Um, it's a relatively new republic, uh, but a very ancient country, as you mentioned. Uh, the Republic of Azerbaijan um, is located in the Caucasus region, precisely in the South Caucasus region, uh, right on the shores of the Caspian Sea. Uh, our neighbors are Russia, Georgia, Armenia, Turkey, and Iran, and the uh, eastern um, borders of Azerbaijan are in the Caspian Sea. So it's a, a very strategic and vital and I would say a diverse and in interesting a part of the world that we live in. Um, and Azerbaijan actually um, gained its independence for the first time as a republic, establishing a republic in 1918. And I think they had the vote for women before the United States. That's true, that's true. A year, an entire year before the United States. So this republic that was established in 1918 was a, se a first secular democracy, first secular republic in the entire Muslim world. And in a year later, in 1919, a parliament adopted a law uh, enfranchising women, giving them the right to vote, equal rights, w uh, rights with men. So uh, it was before the United States a year, but also a decade before several uh, advanced uh, democracies in Europe. But I recall visiting the country when it was under the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. it was one of the republics, and it wasn't too clean, Baku mm -hmm. was very polluted. And then I go back when it's an independent country again a few years ago, and you've cleaned up the environment. That's right. Um, that republic I mentioned in 1918, um, two years later in 1920, um, the uh, Soviets invaded Azerbaijan, and Azerbaijan was um, made part, forcefully forced to become part of the Soviet Union. Uh, so about 71 years, Azerbaijan was uh, one of the republics within the Soviet Union. Uh, before, in 1991, the people of Azerbaijan again regained its independence, establishing the Second Republic, Independent Republic of Azerbaijan. And we have been independent since then, since 1991. And you're right, um, under the Soviet um, uh, governance, um, the uh, um, environment was not the, one of the priorities. In such a small area, you have such diversity of wildlife, flora and fauna, many, many species. Oh, over t uh, 4,000 of them, plant species and over 600 animal species actually in Azerbaijan. And a tree that's thousands of years old? Oh, actually, uh, Eldar pine, which has uh, withstood the climate change of the past 13 million years, and, and iron tree and, and, and others. And hopefully you're <laughs> working on making sure that the climate change doesn't destroy all of this plant and animal. So Azerbaijan has uh, joined almost all of the uh, environmental protection uh, conventions internationally, uh, including the Par Paris Convention on Climate Change. So we are um, one of the most active in that regard because we understand how important it is to protect the beautiful flora and fauna we have in the country. And you're building up your tourism industry, your ecotourism opportunities, but how green and sustainable are these? 
Azerbaijan is known for its oil like or gas natural gas but we know that these are depletable resources so it's not uh, they're finite so Azerbaijan is not developing its uh, wind and solar energy uh, renewable energy actually we have a state agency for uh, renewable energy so because Azerbaijan has enormous solar potential enormous wind potential actually Baku is called uh, the Chicago of the Caucasus so we are trying to make use of that uh, in order to have uh, um, uh, all these resources renewables uh, once the oil and gas run out which of course will take many many decades to come but we want to be prepared and to be self-reliant uh, and increase the amount of renewables over the years to come the history of your oil fields is quite fascinating because you had the first oil well before we had it in Pennsylvania mm -hmm. in the United States? Yeah, 11 years before Pennsylvania in 1848. The first oil well was dug in Azerbaijan at Baku. And the famous Nobel brothers of the Nobel Peace Prize? Uh, yes, yeah. Also were there working. Once this uh, oil was discovered in Baku, many oil um, giants, the giants of the oil industry back then, they rushed to Baku, including Nobel brothers. They created their company. Alfred Nobel himself never made it to Azerbaijan, but he sent two of his brothers brothers to the country and they stayed here actually until the Soviets invaded Azerbaijan in, in uh, 1920 so uh, today they calculated around one-third of the Nobel Prize Fund was made in Baku with Azerbaijani oil and the oil fields were very significant in the World War two we are very proud of the contribution we made to defeat Hitler with Azerbaijani oil uh, because Azerbaijan provided around 80% of fuel for the Soviet army and around 70% of overall oil for the Soviet Union. Without that, it would have been impossible for the Soviet army to defeat uh, Nazi Germany and Hitler. And actually Hitler uh, made the whole campaign towards the Caucasus with the single purpose of getting hold of Baku and its oil fields. And if it would have happened, that would have meant the end of the World War II in favor of Hitler. Thankfully, it didn't happen, and, um, and you know the rest of the history. You have other interesting natural resources in the country. I was surprised to go to one of your parks that had flames 24 hours coming out of the mountainside. <laughs> you had what was called mud volcanoes. They look kind of like mini geysers <laughs> bursting 24 hours. That's right. This is um, the, the one, the first one is called Burning Mountains, Yanardag. It's a, a natural gas coming, coming out of uh, soil and which gives you this permanent uh, fire. Uh, but also the other one, mud, mud volcanoes, uh, half of the world's mud volcanoes are in Azerbaijan, around 400 of them. It's um, recently there was an article on um, CNN and they, the CNN called actually Azerbaijan the mud volcano capital <laughs> of, of the world. So these are this uh, beautiful natural phenomenon. They also attract, of course, um, a lot of attention and tourists uh, love it uh, much. In general, if you go deeper, the name Azerbaijan, uh, one of the um, ethnological meanings would be the, fire, the land of fire because uh, in this Apsharan Peninsula there was uh, oil uh, onshore for many many centuries and suddenly uh, flames would come out and that uh, gave the name uh, of land of fire or land of flames to the country. The land has been ruled by many different civilizations and when I went to the rock pictographs, mm -hmm. I realized how many thousands of years people have inhabited this region, including seeing some ancient Roman stonework. That's right. Uh, it's called Gobustan. Uh, it's um, in the vicinity of our uh, capital city of Baku. And the Gobustan has a very uh, special 
rock carving art dating back to tens of thousands of years. Uh, one of the earliest proto-human habitations was there. And it was discovered actually in 1960s and became a museum and this is today it's under the UNESCO uh, protection. It's one of the World Heritage Sites. Um, yes, yeah, so when you go to this area you see all these beautiful rock carving, uh, rock carvings. Um, uh, actually, the uh, Norwegian traveler, world famous traveler, Thor Heyerdahl. He wrote Kantiki. Uh, yes, Kantiki. And he came to Azerbaijan, but for the first time when he saw this rock art, he uh, recognized them. He said, I have seen this similar uh, art in uh, Scandinavia, in Norway, in other parts of Scandinavia. And his theory actually was that um, Vikings came from the Caucasus to Scandinavia uh, because of the similarities in, the, in this rock carving art. And he kept coming back to Azerbaijan until the, the, uh, his, his uh, last years. So this is, a, a, of course, a, a very, uh, one of the an most ancient places. It's actually also the meeting place has been also a meeting place of civilizations. You, you mentioned Romans came and the others, um, um, there were many uninvited guests <laughs> in Azerbaijan, uh, but at the same time Azerbaijan was uh, located right on the, at the intersection of East and West, right on the ancient Silk Road. The country is a place of interfaith harmony, many different religions. Some have started there, some have been protected. You have which many, what groups do you have? That's right. So uh, as it was right between, located right in between civilizations, between um, East and West, or, um, many uh, cultures, religions intersected in Azerbaijan. And um, so we had a, a Zoroastrian religion, uh, one of the uh, birthplaces, actually, of Zoroastrianism was in Azerbaijan. Um, even today, when you go uh, to Baku, there is a fire temple right in the vicinity of Baku, uh, which was built uh, 500 years ago uh, by um, Zoroastrians, and it's still being used uh, for, uh, uh, by pilgrims from India. A Parsi in Zoroastrians from India, from Mumbai, who do annual pilgrimages to, to this fire temple, they consider it their Mecca. In fact, one of the uh, apostles of Jesus, Bartholomew, came to Azerbaijan to spread Christianity in the first century, and then in the fourth century, early fourth century, in 313, our ancestral state called Caucasian Albania became one of the earliest states, states accepting, adopting Christianity as a state religion. So the, the Christian heritage is pretty old in Azerbaijan. And the Jews left when the first temple in Jerusalem was destroyed over 2,500 years ago. And they That's settled right. and have lived there and still live there. That's right. They, uh, once the temple was destroyed, they um, um, uh, came to Azerbaijan through Babylon and Iran and settled down in the mountainous areas of the country. Hence the name mountains Jews, or mountain Jews, or highland Jews uh, that live in Azerbaijan, that have lived ever since in our country. Uh, they are not Sephardic, not Ashkenazi, they are Mizrahi Jews. Um, so we have today around 30,000 of them living peacefully together with uh, Muslims and Christians and representatives of other faiths without any anti-Semitism, without any discrimination uh, in, in, the, in our country. In fact, uh, they are the, there's a Jewish member of the parliament, one of the Supreme Court justices is Jewish uh, uh, woman. Tatiana Goldman, and so they are very well represented in all uh, branches of Azerbaijani government, uh, but also they are very much involved in a social, political life of the country. So they are an integral uh, part of, our, of the fabric of our society. And what I liked was the fact that the old buildings, historic buildings, are not just ruins and they're not just museums, but have been protected and preserved so that people can continue their faith regardless of what it is. That's right. As we became independent in, uh, or regained our independence in 1991, uh, religious uh, freedom, freedom of religion uh, was one of the m biggest priorities for the government. Uh, our government, the government of Azerbaijan, is secular. The state is separated from religion, uh, but at the same time it does not um, prohibit the government uh, helping 
uh, religious communities and uh, building and rebuilding house of worship for our religious community. For example, a brand new synagogue was built by the government of Azerbaijan for the Jewish community, Mountains Jewish community in Baku, or um, cultural centers for the churches. Uh, churches were renovated by the government of Azerbaijan, and on an annual basis, the government allocates funds to various religious communities because the whole idea is to make sure that this harmony and peaceful coexistence among religions in Azerbaijan continues to strengthen and blossom in this country because that's I think a, a role model for many others in our wider region and showing the possibility of peace among their various faith. But even in the capital city of Baku you preserve some of the old palaces and the old buildings but yet you have the flaming towers, mm. the brand new gorgeous modern architecture and one of the most beautiful architectural structures in the world, very modern, that's a museum and a concert hall that's right. and it doesn't have a single square corner. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So the, um, in, in Azerbaijan, especially in the capital, you see uh, medieval architecture, that uh, old, in old town, the palace of Shirvan Shahs. So you get immersed in that, uh, like in the time uh, 500 years ago, 600 years ago, or even earlier, what made in tower a thousand years ago. So it's uh, by the same time surrounded by Baroque style buildings from the turn of the century, early 20th century, end of the 19th century. Uh, during the first oil boom in Baku. And then, as an independent nation, uh, there is a new architecture. The Flame Towers, of course, but also Haider Aliyev Cultural Center that you mentioned, that was designed by the world-famous architect Saha Hadid. And it has all curves, no straight lines. And it's, a, one of the, it's considered to be one of the most beautiful uh, cultural centers in the world. One of the most beautiful <laughs> buildings in the world. And I can the, attest to that because I enjoyed it. Actually, the Go Google made a doodle uh, recognizing uh, uh, this architecture, this marvel of the architecture a couple of years ago. But like every country, you have to worry about the air quality, the water quality. Is it all clean and pure? Yeah. So, um, under the Soviet Union, of course, um, there was a lot of oil production in Baku, onshore and offshore. Uh, so, for the Soviet authorities, uh, the priority was to get as much oil as possible. So uh, that's why not enough attention was being paid to environmental protection. S uh, when we became independent, we found, of course, a lot of oil polluted areas around Baku, but also in the Caspian Sea. So as Azerbaijan started um, getting revenues, um, and uh, uh, we started also spending uh, and investing a lot in uh, cleaning these oil polluted areas. I'll give you just one example. They w right at Baku, there's a, there was a city called Black City. And you can imagine it was because of, of all those oil rigs and oil pollution. But the government of Azerbaijan is now implementing uh, a project that is turning this Black City into a White City. The, the name of the actual the city will be White City and uh, it's uh, already almost done and it's one of the largest urban development projects in the world. Because you are bordered by so many different countries and the rivers, the waters, maybe in more than one country, you have to worry about what other countries are doing and nations are doing. Is that a concern? I know even in Europe and North America we have to worry about that. So, um, oil pollution and cleaning that oil polluted areas uh, is one of the uh, priorities of the government and we are, I think, have been doing a tremendous work in that regard and we already see uh, positive results. Uh, but there are things that we cannot control, unfortunately. For example, the main uh, water resources of Azerbaijan uh, are coming from two main rivers uh, that um, uh, start um, in other countries and end in Azerbaijan, end in the Caspian Sea. One of them is Aras River and it's, it, it crosses, uh, it starts in Turkey, crosses uh, the territory of uh, the Republic of Armenia and ends in Azerbaijan. Um, Azerbaijan and Armenia uh, 
had a, a war in the early 1990s. Actually, Armenia declared a war uh, on Azerbaijan, invading around 20% of Azerbaijan's sovereign territory, expelling around 1 million people, Azerbaijanis, who are today refugees and internal displaced people. So, as a result of this invasion, illegal occupation, uh, we have no relationship with Armenia. Uh, unfortunately, Armenia has turned um, this whole situation into uh, uh, using it against Azerbaijan also environmentally. This Aras River that is that's passing through uh, the southern border of Armenia is being polluted heavily by Armenia. Um, the uh, sewage water from industrial facilities, uh, domestic waste, everything is being dumped in that river and once it enters Azerbaijan of course it becomes a water resource for, for our country so it's, it causes a huge ecological uh, catastrophe and another uh, interesting example is that there is a nuclear power plant in Armenia called Metsamor which was built during Soviet times and we have uh, information that the nucle nuclear waste from that uh, power plant, the radioactive materials are also being dumped into the RS River. And this is, I think, nothing more than an ecological genocide against Azerbaijan, on top of other uh, genocidal acts that were p uh, committed by Armenian troops against Azerbaijani people. Now we are facing this environmental genocide committed by Armenia against Azerbaijan. It's going to take and a lot of work to and we have the environment. And we have raised these issues repeatedly before international organizations like Council of Europe and other uh, United Nations. Actually, the Council of Europe's Parliamentary Assembly uh, also uh, paid a lot of attention to it, passed some resolution. But I think the international community should put enough pressure on Armenia to stop this ecological, environmental genocide. Anytime there's pollution, we must protect our environment and it helps the people, helps the wildlife. That's right. But we only have a few minutes left, and I really want to talk about something special from your country, and it's up on the Voyager spacecraft. <laughs> it's true, flying. <laughs> yes, the music and dance of That's Azerbaijan right. is really fun, delightful. I enjoyed dancing. The costumes are <laughs> colorful, the traditional outfits, but you have a unique form of music, Mugam Shur. What is yes. that? So, um, in 1970s, when NASA was building uh, it's the Voyager spacecraft, identical, two identical twin spacecraft to send to, to space and um, to the orbit and actually to travel all along the planets. They were they plan they attached actually golden records to this spacecraft, and they were looking for songs to include on these golden records. And they chose only 27 songs from around the globe, and one of them was this music called uh, Shur. It's a uh, in the genre of Mugam, which is an improvised music from Azerbaijan. So. It's a three minute long uh, song. It's now on Voyager spacecraft, which has already probably passed Pluto and probably on the edge of the solar system. But it's a lot of sim symbolic and uh, actually representing the world's cultural heritage. Shall we listen to a little? Oh, that would be wonderful. The culture goes back and represents many different civilizations, but the music has continued for centuries, and the dance is beautiful, flowing costumes for the women and fast legwork for the men, <laughs> and they still do it at parties. That's right. Actually, Azerbaijanis learn how to dance uh, from their childhood, because uh, at the wedding, parties, um, uh, there's all this dance. People dance, and the, the children especially, they like dancing, and that's how people start learning it. And on your and holidays? On the holidays, the holidays, the holidays like Novra's holiday New or Year's. other holidays, New Year's. So um, there's always 
uh, all these festivities. So this dance which uh, combines elements of Caucasian dance and Middle Eastern dance in once and becomes a very beautiful end result uh, is of course uh, uh, something to, to preserve and to develop even further. And we have dance ensembles uh, uh, that uh, the government uh, supports um, and also uh, as in the uh, opera, ballet. Azerbaijan has one of the most ancient cultural and musical heritage in the world. Actually, the first opera, operetta, and ballet in the Muslim world were all composed and staged in Azerbaijan, uh, starting from 1908. And when one travels there, you have fresh, delicious local food oh, yeah. and drink. <laughs> pomegranates? Pomegranates, actually, we have a pomegranate festival in the city of Gechai. Um, where they do lots of competitions and during this festival it's usually in October. And your country offers so much cultural and natural history. How would you sum up this incredible place? So today Azerbaijan is independent again. So we, our people, acquired its independence uh, 27 years ago. And this is the strongest Azerbaijan has been its, in, in its history. Uh, under our visionary president, we have built actually a country that's very proud of its history, but at the same time it's embracing modernity, is it? is building a modern nation despite all the challenges we are facing in that um, not so easy part of the world. So um, we are open to everyone uh, that's coming to us with um, friendship and we are building wonderful relations with many different countries in the region beyond a strong friendship with the United States of America uh, which has been a crucial partner and ally for Azerbaijan for all these years and we have an excellent relationship covering so many areas but also with so many others uh, it's a country that's building bridges among civilizations among cultures and we will strengthen uh, our positions in that regard over the years to come and so the country's I think future is very bright Thank you Thank so you. very much for sharing your country with us. Thank you for being my guest. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. I hope that you have enjoyed our exploration of Azerbaijan. This Euro-Asian country has so much to offer the ecotourist. I look forward to visiting this fascinating area again. On behalf of Eco News and our nonprofit organization, Educational Communications, I'm Nancy Perlman wishing you a natural and spoiled environment.